You hear me now? Yes. He sang last night as well, and I want to thank him so much for blessing us in such a powerful way. And I want to thank Pastor Dotton again for his invitation and uh, his hospitality and his kindness. I know that he's tired, so he's the only one. If I see him sleeping during the sermon, he's the only one that I'll allow to sleep through the sermon. And uh, I'll give him that grace today because he was, with, uh, he was with some folks here at the church late last night and then he was with his precious child uh, until five in the morning. And I know that he may be tired and I trust that um, he'll have some lay activities later today and that he'll catch some rest. And if he doesn't today, I'll make sure that he sleeps on the bus as we journey to Alabama together. As we head to Alabama together. Um, and that's, that's a trip that we're taking. It's a very good conference that uh, we've been to together before. And uh, we'll be heading to that concert, or that uh, conference this evening. And it's my pleasure today to share another word with you. We've been together since Wednesday night. Wednesday night we examined the topic entitled, What is Your Life? We examined that topic on Wednesday night. We saw that James describes life as a mist, something that is here today and gone tomorrow. And so it's important to make sure that your life is invested in something that will last forever. And then last night as we gathered here, we looked at the topic, Lessons from the Storm. Lessons from the Storm. I shared an experience with you that happened to me this summer. Myself, Christy and Aiden, we traveled to a picnic. We journeyed to a park to have a picnic and we got caught in a storm and we learned some lessons and we shared those lessons with you last night and we looked at the storm that is raging in this world. Book of Revelation talks about how the angels are holding back the wind of strife. And we are living in some serious times. We looked at that last night. And today as we turn to God's Word, we're going to examine the topic entitled Kingdom Criteria. Kingdom Criteria. We talked last night about the coming of our Lord the second coming of Christ and the kingdom of God. And today we look at the topic Kingdom Criteria. I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Our loving Father in heaven, Lord, you have brought us together today. This is a divine appointment and so we pray, Lord, that you will take these feeble lips of clay and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Lord, I present myself a living sacrifice and pray for the power of your Holy Spirit. Help me, Lord, not to get in the way, but grant that your word will go forth with power and not return unto you void. For we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Let everyone say, Amen. If you are an elementary teacher, early childhood educator, an uncle, an aunt, or a parent like myself, then you no doubt have come to realize that it can be quite amusing to sit back and listen to some of, some of the statements that children make. I came across a list of humorous quotations from children recently. In the first book of the Bible, Guinnesses, not Genesis, but Guinnesses, God got tired of creating the world, so he took the Sabbath off. The first commandment was when Eve told Adam to eat the apple. The fifth commandment is to humor thy father and mother. And the seventh commandment is thou shall not admit adultery. Jesus 
enunciated the golden rule, which says, do one to others before they do one to you. He also explained, man doth not live by sweat alone. The people who followed the Lord were called the Twelve Decibels. The epistles were the wives of the apostles. One of the apostles was Saint Matthew, who was a taxi man. I have to say, I get a kick out of some of the things that children say. And I have to say, I get a kick out of some of the things that Aiden says. Aiden is being very gracious today. He's allowing me to share some things with you. In fact, over time, I have compiled a list of what I like to call Aidenisms. They are funny, cute comments that have come from the mouth of Aiden. He said to me one day, Uncle Matt, when you fast, you just eat fast food and pray. <laughs> He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a ketchup seed. On another day, he talked about God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Kid. One day, he told me about the Pharisees, and he said, the Pharisees were people who were not very fair. And my personal favorite is when he said, Jesus is the king of the Jews. It's hard to ignore the sweet innocence of a little child. Jesus never did. In fact, he not only paid attention to them, he paid great tribute to them by making their qualities and character the criteria for entering the kingdom of heaven. Then Jesus called a little child to him in Matthew chapter 18 verses 2 to 5, set him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, Unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. I love the way this passage reads in the J.B. Phillips version of the Bible. Jesus called a little child to his side and set him on his feet in the middle of them all. Believe me, he said, unless you change your whole outlook and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What is it about children? that makes their attitude the only one acceptable in the kingdom. I mean, children are far from perfect. Raise your hand if you are a parent here today. Raise your hand, let me see your hand. All the parents, let me see your hand. Now keep your hands raised, keep your hands raised if your children are perfect. I don't see one hand. Oh, I see a few. But they're just humoring us today. Children are far from perfect. They need to be catered to. They can be critical, uncaring, selfish, and short-sighted. It sounds like some of us actually sometimes. But children also have many redeeming characteristics as well. There are some lessons about life that we could learn from little children. For starters, children are excited about life. Have you ever been through bedtime negotiations with a little child? Can I just stay up for 10 more minutes? No. Five more minutes. Let me just stay up for five more minutes. And then when the five minutes is up, can I please just stay up for five more minutes? I'm convinced that children view the concept of sleep as some sort of conspiracy against them. No child understands the logic of going to bed when there is energy left in the body and sunlight left in the day. Sunsets arrive too soon and sunrises can't come any sooner. And that's because children are enthusiastic and excited about life. Max Lucado tells the story of one night when his five-year-old daughter was going to bed. And just as she was falling asleep, she opened wide her eyelids and said to her father, I can't wait until I wake up. 
<laughs> oh, for the attitude of a five-year-old. If only we could possess that passion for living that cannot wait for tomorrow. I guess, though, that we are like children in a way. We groan about bed just like they do, only we groan about getting out of bed instead of getting into bed. We seldom say, I can't wait until I wake up, and more often we say, I can't wait to go to bed. The busy highways, grumpy bosses, and daily burdens of life weigh us down and they wear us out. Can I get a witness in the house today? But I stop by here to encourage you and to tell you, don't let them steal your joy. Don't dread tomorrow. Don't be worried about what's going to happen. Don't dread the sunset smile with the sunrise. Don't be too sober-minded and too serious-faced as adults. Heard pastor talking about how we need to smile when the camera's on us. How about we just smile all the time? How about we try and turn that frown upside down? How about we come to church not looking like we were baptized in lemon juice, but looking like we are grateful for life and glad that we serve a God who is good all the time? We need to be happy for life and the opportunity to live. That's what children do. Aiden is wide awake and ready to go early in the morning. By the time I woke up this morning, Aiden was already having his breakfast. He was ready to go. And he said to me, Uncle Matt, he said, have you worked on your sermon yet? <laughs> I said, well, maybe you should just preach a sermon for me. Children are excited about life. Children are also amazed by the wonder of life. As adults, most of us have become blasé about this world. Too many times we've lost our sense of wonder. It comes back occasionally when we see something really spectacular, but for the most part, we drift through life with a been there, done that, read the book, and wrote the book kind of attitude. But not children. They see the magic in the rainbows and the stars. They laugh at animals playing and marvel at God's creation. We like to go to the Toronto Zoo, one of the best zoos in the world. We like to see the lions and the tigers and the bears. And it's amazing to see the reaction of Aiden when he sees these animals. It's amazing to see him get excited about some of the things I've seen a thousand times. It's amazing when we're traveling north of the city on the 400. Maybe you've done it before and you're heading towards Vaughan and, and you begin to see those tracks in the sky, those, those railroads that spin and make circle, those, those beautiful amusement uh, rides at Wonderland. And when Aiden sees that, that's what happens to him. Wonder fills his mind and he cannot stop looking at the roller coasters we are passing by. We need to regain our sense of wonder. King David wrote in Psalm 77 and verse 14, You are the God of miracles and wonders. We serve a God who created this world. We serve a God who spoke and there was light. Who told the waters how far they could come forward and then stopped them and said, come forward no more. We serve a God who took a little dust and took a little bit of his breath and put it together and formed man and woman. We serve someone who can speak things into existence. And he has created a beautiful world. Mankind has raped and extorted and destroyed the world, but he's created a beautiful world. Do you realize as a human being, you represent on average 
five million hairs, 20 square feet of skin, 650 muscles, 206 bones, 100 joints, 96,000 kilometers of blood vessels, and over 13 million nerve cells. And you're going to tell me that this happened just by chance? Maybe you heard the story of the scientist who challenged God saying, we can now do everything. Mankind is more sophisticated than ever before. We can now do everything. And I can even create life. I challenge you to a man-making contest. And God said, okay, you're on. You go first. And the scientist reached down and picked up a handful of dirt and was about to begin creating man. And God said, oh, no, you don't. You have to make your own dirt. <laughs> This world is no accident. No one here today is here by chance. God chose to give you life before you were formed in your mother's womb. You were formed in the mind of God. And he has made you and created you for a purpose. It's the wonders of wonders. And it's amazing to think that the same creator who created us and created this universe also chose to himself be born as a child, to suffer persecution in his public ministry, and then willingly surrender himself to die on a cross for the sins of his creation so that we might go to heaven. If anything ought to fill your mind with wonder, it ought to be the sacrifice of the Son of God. Children are amazed by wonder. And children are not intimidated by the impossibilities of life. Tony Campala was the founder of the president of the Evangelical Association of the Promotion of Education in America. He works with children in poverty-stricken areas of urban America. And it's amazing the kind of interactions he has with children. Despite their social and economic status, the children of these urban areas in which they live, they still believe that they have a future. He asks them over and over again, what are you going to do? What are you going to be when you grow up? And without hesitation, these precious children say, I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to be a surgeon. I'm going to be a musician. I'm going to be a professional basketball player in the NBA. They believe in the future, despite their surroundings and their environment, despite that the odds are against them. There is no limit to their hopes and their dreams. And that's the way we should be. We need to dare to dream. We need to have a type of faith that challenges God to do the impossible. It's dangerous for us not to do so, for the Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. They say that a person is old when his dreams are more precious than his visions of the future. We serve a God who can fulfill the dreams of both the young and the old. We serve a God who made a promise to Abraham when he was in his 90s. Guess what, Abraham? You're about to have a baby. Any 90-year-olds in the house? Any senior citizens that are ready to have a child? You're never too old and never too young to surrender to God who will not only make you believe in yourself, but also make you believe in your future. If you had told me when I was a teenager, messed up on drugs and drinking Mickeys of rum and getting into all kinds of trouble. If you had told me that one day I would be standing in the Kitchener Seven Day Adventist Church as a preacher of righteousness with a BA and an MA and all kinds of letters and all kinds of experiences, I would have told you that you're crazy. <laughs> but you see, when God looked at me, 
He didn't see the bleach blonde hair, and he didn't see the baggy pants, he didn't see the earrings, he didn't see the habits, he didn't see the addictions, he didn't see the problems, he didn't see the pain. He saw a pastor. He saw somebody that he could put to work, somebody that he could use in his service. And when he looks at you, he doesn't see what you see. He doesn't see what you are. He sees what you can become through the power of his mercy and his grace, which is sufficient for your weakness. We often talk about the good old days. We, we think of how it used to be, but you know, children are too young to have any good old days. They can't look backward. They can only look forward. Faith in God means you need to be forward thinking, longing for the future and not just living in the past. Children are teachable. Aiden is inquisitive. I have to say, he asked me, I would have to say at least a million questions a day. Maybe two million. He'll ask a question, and then he follows it up with the famous, how come? And then when he gets the answer, he says, why? And so it, it adds up to about a million questions a day. He's inquisitive. He wants to learn. He wants to understand. He knows he doesn't have all the answers. But on the flip side, we as adults often feel like we know everything there is to know about life. We want to teach and not be taught. They say you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but you have to be careful. If you're not willing to learn and you're not willing to listen, then you're in a very dangerous place spiritually. If you're an old dog, and even if you know many tricks, I guarantee you that you don't know everything because the Bible tells us that only God is all-knowing. So you yourself must always be willing to learn like a little child. Children are teachable. Children are trusting. Do you remember as a child leaping into your father's or mother's arms and knowing that you would be safe and that he or she wouldn't drop you. Aiden and I like to go swimming. And uh, Aiden is still learning to swim. So I have to hold him and help him in the water. And one of Aiden's most favorite things to do is to jump in the water. And he likes to jump, but he wants me to catch him and he is so trusting that I'm going to help him and make sure he doesn't drown that sometimes he jumps and I'm not even ready. <laughs> I mean, I'll just get in the water. My back is still turned to him and I hear a splash and I have to like scramble as if I was on Baywatch and just like save this child. Children are trusting. Have you ever listened to the prayers of a child? There's no limits to what they ask for. They'll ask for big things. They'll ask for small things. I've listened to Aiden pray. Pray for healing. Pray for miracles. Pray for God to do the impossible. I've heard him pray for little things too. I'm not afraid to pray for anything. Dear God, please, when I wake up in the morning, Please grant that I will pass level two of Super Mario, please. <laughs> Children trust God and they trust his promises. Psalm 50 and verse 15, the Bible says, trust me in your times of trouble and I will rescue you. And you will give me glory, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, 25 to 35. Essentially, he said, don't stress, just seek. Don't worry about what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will wear or how you're going to do this and how you're going to pay for that and, and what's going to happen. Don't worry about all the things that the Gentiles and unbelievers worry about. Don't stress, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. 
One of the greatest statements of trust I've ever heard came from Elsa Einstein who said, I do not understand my husband's theory of relativity, but I know my husband and I know he can be trusted. And even Jesus in his humanity trusted his father. He said, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Paul trusted God. He was in prison. He was on death row. And yet he said, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. You may not always understand all of what's happening in your life at all times, but just trust God. I stop by here to encourage you. You may not understand why you have this sickness. You may not understand why you have these family problems. You may not understand what's going on with your job and your future. You may not be able to trace God, but when you cannot trace his hand, I encourage you you to trust his heart Amen. trust God and be like a little child children are teachable children are trusting and children haven't lost their ability to forgive have you lost your ability to forgive have you ever had to ask one of your children to forgive you I've had to ask Aiden, because I am far from perfect as a parent. And I've said to him, Aiden, you know, I'm really sorry. And you know what his response is? Without any hesitation, before I even finish my sentence, it's okay. <laughs> and life just continues as usual. I wish we could all be like that. I grew up the youngest of six children. And my siblings were much older than I. And I can remember as a child being like Aiden. Something would happen. There was a fight. There was some tears. There was a conflict. And I would just forget about it and carry on the next day. But I began to notice as I got older that even though I was carrying on and forgiving and even though I loved my siblings and was talking to them every day, they weren't talking to each other. Some of them are still not talking to this day. The older they got, the less they were able to forgive. Philippians 2 verses 14 to 16 says, Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. You want to be blameless as a church and pure as a people of God? Children of God, it says, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. Oh, how we need to be childlike. I want you to know today the Bible isn't telling us to be childish. Some of us are childish. There's a difference between child being childish and childlike. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child and thought like a child and I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Jesus is telling us to be childlike and to emulate the good qualities and characteristics of children. Don't lose your innocence. Don't lose your ability to love. Don't lose your ability to forgive and embrace. Don't become like many in this world who when they look at people, they do, not, they do not see children created in the image of God. They see people who are from a certain status in society, who have a certain color of skin, who have certain degrees, and academic success. Be childlike. For Jesus said, unless you are converted and become like little children, 
you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. In June of this year, I found myself, like never before in my life, thinking about heaven. I found myself wanting to go to heaven like never before. Throughout my existence as a Seventh-day Adventist, I've known that one day we will go to heaven. But it's not something I was necessarily looking forward to because I want to live my life here on earth. But in June of this year, I was with my family in an Ottawa hospital. And I watched my mother breathe her last breath. For months, she battled and suffered with a terminal disease known as pulmonary fibrosis. We were told that she would live three to five years, but she barely lived one year. And as I laid my mother to rest, I found myself like never before wanting to go to heaven. Wanting to be with her, we ran a montage of pictures in the order of, in chrono chronologically, in the order of her life. I saw her as a young woman. She was beautiful. She did some modeling. She was gorgeous. Saw her, saw her with little animals. She, she was always so caring, so compassionate, loved animals, loved people, found pictures of her, taking care of children, people with disabilities. And I sat there and I thought of my mom. I had buried my father. That was hard in 2007. But as I buried my mother, like never before, I found myself wanting to go to heaven. And I found myself looking at Bible passages. What do we need to do to go to heaven? Found myself in the Gospels. Jesus over and over again using that phrase, unless you do such and such, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you become like a little child, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And ever since that time, I have been striving to be a little child. I don't want to grow up. I want to be a child of God all the days of my life. So where are you today? Are you a child of God? Are you excited about life? Amazed by life? Are you trusting? Are you teachable? Are you forgiving? Are you faithful? Are you a child of God or a grumpy old fart? Are you coming to Christ as a child or are you just acting childish? The choice is yours today. But I know for myself that I want to be a Christian in my heart. Today, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to look at yourself and ask yourself if you measure up to the words of Christ in Matthew chapter 18. And if you find yourself falling short, if you find yourself like the disciples, you know what they were doing when Jesus said what he said? They were arguing about position who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And when they asked him, you know what Jesus did? He didn't answer them. He took a little child 
and he put the child in their midst and had them look at this child and said, you have to be like a little child to enter the kingdom of heaven. Lord, I want to be a Christian.